good evening, wherever you're listening to this broadcast, and welcome to another Word Up Bible Study. This is Dr. Duncans. You do not want to miss the Word Up Bible Study. For all of you who are joining us today uh, on our social media platform for this Bible study, uh, we want to thank you for joining us and ask that you would do several things. We want you to like, like the broadcast, share the broadcast. As a matter of fact, I want you to love our broadcast and share this broadcast. Right now, share, call some family and friends and get them on the line. You don't want to miss the revelation, the pertinent information I'm about to talk about. Get ready. I'll even whet your appetite with this statement to let you know what the Lord has dropped in my spirit. Listen to this. There is nothing that God cannot do. There is nothing that God can't do in your life if you activate the faith that you already have. Let me explain how powerful that statement is. I did not say there's nothing God can't do in your life or, you know, nothing impossible for God if you have enough faith. That has been the error I have been trying to overcome and correct through this series of studies on putting your faith into action. Here's the truth that's worth you signing, worth you signing in for. And that is you need to put the faith in action that you have. It's not that you don't have enough faith. It's how you put it in action. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you buy something that is that runs by batteries, even when you get the batteries, you put them in, you get a fresh set of batteries, you put those batteries in. For all intents and purposes, whatever you put the batteries in is ready to operate, right? Wrong. Because you still have to cut on the switch. Are you getting it? Putting your faith into action is taking that energy in those battery cells, turning the switch on, and releasing that faith over your situation. You don't have a problem about not being able to get it. You don't have a problem about God not being able to do it. You don't have a problem about crying and being depressed and down because it's not happening. You have a problem with releasing your faith. Stay with me. That's what this text is about. That's what this study is about. How do we release our faith knowing that the faith that I've had, I've been given the measure. Everyone has been given the measure of faith. How do I release that faith? Let's pray. Then we're going into this exciting study. Don't forget, like and share as soon as you turn in to this broadcast. Put some words in the chat to let me know you're watching. And I have someone who will be watching the chat so that we can have, help you grow as we grow together through this, I would call it, progressive understanding study about the faith in our life. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for your presence that is always with us. You promised to never leave us or forsake us, so we know you're here. And now, God, we ask you to bless the hearing of your word. Everyone that hears what is being said, let them not only be hearers, but doers of your word. Allow them to know, God, that you're still in control and you are working out their situation. All they have to do is trust you and it will happen. So we're talking about how to release or putting into action the faith that we already have. Let's settle something. You're not listening to this broadcast to get more faith. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says grow your faith. It don't say get more faith. The Bible says grow your faith. How you grow your faith, it means when I grow the faith that I have, it gets more intense. It gets stronger. There's a greater connection. It's a stronger anointing. But I have the available faith. So what we need to look at is we've been going through this book of Hebrews chapter by chapter to set a foundation for why this book is the quintessential need to understand what faith is doing. You can take someone with a mustard seed of faith and they can turn around what we would, what we would consider a gigantic situation. you believe that? If you believe that, say yes. So right now, I dare you, as I'm talking, whatever you need that you want God to do, I dare you to place it on the altar right now. I dare you to say, when this study is over, I'm going to have exercised my faith so that I can get blessed. 
Another example, I gave you the batteries, is muscles. You have the number of muscles that you need in your body, but you have to build up your body, i.e. bodybuilders. They build the muscle. I don't need another muscle. I need to strengthen the muscle I have. It's the same way with your faith. You don't need more faith in that traditional sense that I need to get more. You need to grow the faith that you have. So we stopped last time. We started on looking at the book of Hebrews, and we took you through some things in the book of Hebrews after going through all of the chapters. But I'd like to kind of revisit a couple things as we go into this hall of faith. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. No, go to 13. Hebrews 13. In Hebrews 13, it lets us know something about God, which gives us the strength to understand who God is and what God will do in our lives. When you look at Hebrews 13, it talks about the, it's the closing out of this book, right? And I'm just going to read a little of that so you'll see it, what we're talking about. Great stuff in this chapter. You got Hebrews 13 with me? All right, go there. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. Do you realize this book has a supernatural or above natural feel to it? Uh, everything that has to do with God is always outer or above natural. We think supernatural is something spooky, but all this is saying is the God who created everything, anytime he wants to, he can disrupt or, dis, uh, or, or ignore the boundaries of natural things, and he can go above nature. He can do stuff supernatural. He can make things happen that you can't understand in the natural realm of things. But when you bring your faith into action with God's supernatural ability, then he overrides what the natural is saying, and he can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. So many of you, you pray for something supernatural, but you think naturally. That's right. I just said it. You, you think of all the reasons it will not work. I remember reading a, a sermon illustration, um, and it was about the board of a company who said whenever he had a, a problem that they needed to break the ceiling on a problem it was all engineers he said he would call together the meeting of all the engineers tell them what he wants but what he did he made them lead their slide rules and their calculators outside of the boardroom oh why did he do that because he wanted them thinking with faith, not what their natural eye would see. He said, inevitably, once he explained something he wanted to happen, someone would stand up and say, that can't be done. And he was frustrated because everything that is progressive, everything that is new, somebody, I declare to you, said, it cannot be done. It's a shame that you have believers who have been believing for your healing, believing for deliverance, believing for miracles, and yet you have a nerve when God gets ready to do something on the earth to say it cannot be done. Mostly one of the miseries and veins of most prophetic visionary pastors is they have to go before their congregation and ask the congregation to believe above their understanding in the natural. Because everything God asks, he asks you to do it. And he would say, if you can do it without me, you don't need me. But it's something how, when it comes to natural resources like money, like time, like things, I have people always saying, that can't be done. People won't do it. Nobody's going to give to that. I don't know how we're going to raise that money. And eventually, God does it. I can tell you story after story when we built this church that I'm sitting in. We were a very small congregation, did not have very good business acumen. We had just put together all of our statements and we were going to a bank to ask for $1.5 million. And you won't believe the number of people that said that cannot be done. I don't know what $1.5 million is in today's economy based on what it was in 1993. 
but I got a, I got together a group of my leaders and we started acting in faith by speaking and saying and walking over the ground and praying over the offering and giving sacrificial offerings. And before you know it, we were not only standing in a new edifice, but the ministry had grown to a place because faith was... You got a lot of people that build buildings or in small buildings or big buildings, and it seems like they can't get anybody in any building. The reality is you need to create a culture of faith in your church. Create a culture of faith in your house. Create a culture of faith because you're going to need that faith if you're going to make it. Let's continue reading here. So be careful. We're in Hebrews 13. Not to be get, entertained strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them that uh, which suffer mercy as being yourselves also in the body. Then he goes into marriage. But I want to get down to verse 6 where it says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is our helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And verse, verse 8 says the tone for your belief system. Verse 8, okay. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who else can make that claim? Only Jesus. That's why when you put your faith in Jesus, of course people living by what they see and feel, their senses and what makes sense, are never going to be able to understand that if the same Jesus, Jesus Christ, is saved yesterday, today, and forever, which incorporates and embodies the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, each with their several offices. God the Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit is our helper, our, our comforter, our guider. Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Redeemer. God the Father is our Creator. So when we look at these titles, they're still God. He said we can boldly say Jesus Christ. And when we say Jesus Christ is the same, we mean God is the same, the Holy Ghost is the same, because that's still God. And if God could do miraculous things that you like talking about, why can't God do another miraculous thing that you need right now? So what we need to understand is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that is the last um, uh, chapter, chapter 13 in that book. And now we go to our study of Hebrews chapter 11. Go to chapter 11. So if you missed what we're doing here, I took you through a background understanding of Hebrews, the audience, who Paul, who, who the writer was writing to. I took you through an understanding in each one of those texts how Jesus was anchored being better than everything else. So you would know once you call on Jesus, you reached into a realm of power that the world doesn't understand. So now we now want to put into action biblically I could probably ask you out there to give me a testimony. Amen, somebody. And you could testify about faith. But let's look at this from a um, Hebrews 11. They call it the Heroes of Faith, the Hall of Faith Heroes. Whichever way you want to look at it, we're going to read a few verses. And we're going to allow this book of this chapter of Hebrews through the works and through the efforts and through identifying what other patriarchs did by faith. That's why the key to the 11th chapter is by faith. Everybody say by faith. By faith. How are you going to get out of that situation you're in? By faith. How am I going to make sure my children are safe? By faith. How am I going to get the money I need to pay my bills? By faith. How am I going to move to the next level of my salvation? By faith. How am I going to overcome this problem that I'm sitting in right now? By faith, come on, write this down. By faith, I got it. By faith, I can do it. By faith, it's coming to pass. By faith, it will be something that God will bless us with. And if you go into this chapter 11 of Hebrews, it starts out with something very familiar, which is a definition of faith. And as we look at these heroes, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Can I tell you this? Whenever you talk about faith, you have to say, now faith. Somebody said, why, Reverend? I'm glad you asked that question. Because 
yesterday's faith unless you build on it for some now faith. Yesterday's faith, last night's faith, faith from 10 years ago will not help your present situation. You may have been in tune with God during that period of time and you tapped into faith. But you got to look. You may have been void of circumstances. Now maybe you're sick with COVID. COVID. Now maybe you got a cancer diagnosis. Now maybe you see that you're about to get put out of your house. Now you don't know how you have the finances. Now your mind, your mental health is going in and out. And you don't know whether you're sane or whether you're, or you're crazy or you don't know if I'm going to make it. You're depressed and don't know how to lay down and go to sleep. That's when you have to say, now faith, not faith when everything's going well, when it looks like you can make it, when you just shout and you got a smile on your face, you got your hair done, you got the bill paid, got the groceries in the cupboard, gas in the car, nobody's calling you, there's no immediate emergency. How many know that's not it? Faith is always now because a situation is going to rise up where you need faith now. Everybody say now faith. So we're going to complete this character study of each of these men and women because they're living examples that faith is needed in tough times. And you'll see that each one of these folk gave themselves over to God during tough times in their life and they lived by faith. So let's, let me give you something that will take you right into those definitions as we speak a little to lead us into this 11th chapter. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 tells us that faith works through love. Get that. Get it, mean person listening to me. Get it, person sitting there wondering why my faith doesn't work and you've gotten arrogant and angry with everything around you and then you approach God's throne in a manner as if you're loving and pleasing but God tells us that our relationships, our actions, our thoughts toward him first, I know you don't like this, and toward other people will determine how much faith is released. Mm. Let me stop. You got any grudges? You got any unforgiveness? Uh, you got some people you've been angry with and you talk to any kind of way? You got some folk you kind of rough shot over? Have you bullied anybody? And then you go to God, I'm telling you, the reason your faith doesn't work is because faith works by love. If we were to go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we know that the Bible tells us now are these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greater of these is love. Right? Let me read that. Because it's something you need to see that Part of our God is a holistic God. He can look down into an angry heart uh, or selfish heart and find out that this person is not particularly a loving person. It's not someone who the Holy Spirit can flow through, who faith can flow through because of the way they treat other people. One of my greatest Statements, I have two. You've heard me say it before. Never take another person's dignity in public. I know it feels good, but one day it could be you. And secondly, never, ever, ever, ever talk down to a person um, to the point that you're supposed to love them and your words contradict that love. You know, our words can contradict all the love there is. But the last verse of... 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which starts, you know, you can speak in tongue of angels, you know, got all, all power, prophecy, all that, move mountains, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. Well, the 13th verse says, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I need you to know that the Bible is very clear that your faith will not work. Write down 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Here's what Paul says in the NIV version. Your faith is growing more and more, and the love and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. 
Look at it, how it moves. Your faith is growing more and more, and your love for one another is increasing. Love must grow for faith to grow. Put that in the chat. Write it down. My love must grow. I tell everybody, you can be as haughty, as arrogant as you want to be. You can be a Mr. or Mrs. Know-it-all. I need you to know that humility is waiting around the next corner. Something's going to come in your life that has to humble you. And if you understand that, and you want to be someone that uses your faith greatly, love people. Love God. Don't go to God all angry and, and think God's not fair, and yet you're still asking Him for stuff. Love God. Let God see the love in your actions. Love other people. Do stuff for other people. Work with other people. And God will say, that's the person who can tap into my anointing and live and walk by faith. Because I know that everything they do is not about them. And the reality of the kingdom of God is our walk, our relationship with God. I'll say it this way. God has always been all about us. He created us in the garden because he needed, because he wanted companionship. We fell. He still loved us. He brought us through periods of time where he gave us prophets, and then he gave us kings, and then he, he but he always had his word for us. God said, whatever I had to do to keep you, I'm going to do it. This means, here's the order for your faith to grow. Write this down. You got to first understand how much God loves you. Wow. If you understand how much God loves you, then you can have faith. What I mean by that, the reason my kids or my grandkids can call me and my wife up and say, um, can I come by and do this? Can I get this? Do you have this? Can I get this? Uh, can you give me some money for this? You know why they call on us? Because they know we love them. They have enough faith to ask. Come on. If you know somebody don't love you, you're not asking them for anything. But what makes you ask is because that relationship is so fresh that you know this person cares about me. And if I just share with them my circumstances, their love for me will kick in and they will pull out of me what I need. That's what God says. When God's looking around, he sees that you love him by the way you love him. Worship, obedient, following the word. I do this for every pastor and for myself. Many times pastors are going to speak things you don't like. Matter of fact, God will give us things that we don't like. But we have to speak them because God said, this is the direction we're going. And all God asks you to do is walk by faith. How do you walk by faith? By being obedient to those who have to rule over you. How do you walk by faith? By loving your, next, loving your neighbor. Loving the Lord God with all your heart. And loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So God is telling us, that in order for our faith to work, we're talking about releasing. You want to write this down? First order is how much you love God will be how strong your faith will grow. In order for your faith to grow, you got to love God. Secondly, your faith will grow with how much you love other people. Other people. Don't miss this. Selfishness has never made faith grow because selfishness, after a while, just start crying for what it wants. So it's got nothing to do with faith then. It just starts whining for stuff. It's not living by faith. It's whining, saying, I got to do that. But when you're not selfish and you trust and you bless other people, then God actually will bless you because you have confidence enough to know that if I trust God with what he said he's doing, hmm, he will then bless me because I bless somebody else. You get that? So... Faith works by love. And if you understand, there may be something in your life that's not working because you have not lived by faith. So what we need to understand is that the first thing we have to do for our faith to be the kind of faith that God can use is we have to love God and love other people. And you want to know how much faith you have? And here's how you judge the level of faith you have. Um, what do you say to yourself in hard times. If you say words like, I can't make it, or this don't make no sense, or this is too tough, or I don't know if God can do this. Um, what do you say when God makes you wait 
longer than you want to wait? Do you stay cheerful? Do you stay full of joy? Or do all of a sudden your countenance change? What do you say when someone does you wrong? Or someone says something about you out of character? When someone mistreats you? How you react, listen to me, is going to determine how much faith you have. Why do you say that? Because when they stoned Jesus Christ on the cross, as he was dying for your sins and mine, they spit on him, they whipped him, they beat him, they called him names. But because he is the very essence of love, he is love, he said, Father, forgive them. And he didn't just make that up and push it. You know, some of us have said, I got to forgive you because the Bible says so. You ought to be glad the Bible says so, I had to forgive you. That's not real forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you see that person, you still feel some kind of way. But you allow your spirit to override the negativity. And you actually can love a person you hate. Somebody just tuned in just to get that today. This is hindering your faith, right? And so there's so many things. When you have that power released in your life, what faith can do? It can save us from our sin. Not just our sins, but our sin and make us right with God. So it gives us this first place, this movement or transition from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. How is that done? By faith. But well, once we're there, faith can help us stay right with God by following his word by faith, not by what we see, not by what things happen to us. Um, faith in God constantly rebuilding means we constantly stay filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit can override our natural tendencies and help us start walk, walking in faith. Um, it means that if something went wrong in your life, before you were saved, then a curse word, uh, a cussing word may have flew out of your mouth. You know, someone's like, hit your finger with a hammer. You say the first thing that's on the top of your subconscious. But once you get saved, you find yourself saying stuff like this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Somebody got this. You'll say like, praise the Lord. Oh, bless you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Other words come out of you because you understand now that I am filled with faith. Faith can purify your heart. And if your heart is pure, you can stand in the presence of God. Faith gives you security and confidence. I can't see it, but my belief in it is so strong, I act on my belief. I can't see it, but my belief in it is so strong, I act on it with my belief. Let's say it one more time a little differently. I can't see it in the natural. I can see it with my spiritual eyes. So I act on it with my faith and my belief. God is saying my security and confidence is, even though I may not see it with my natural eye, I believe God can. Faith brings hope. It brings provision. It brings blessing. It gives us freedom. And faith in God stops the enemy from winning over us. How do I know? Write this text down. Ephesians 6, 16. This is the Amplified Version. Lift up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery or flaming arrows of the evil one. It is by faith that we extinguish all the darts the devil throws at us. Faith can do us no good, though, until we release it. So let's look at this. Very quickly. Um, chapter 11. You with me? Chapter 11 describes it. He describes what faith is like. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Let's break that down. Don't say it too fast. Faith is my confidence. All right? Right where you are, with that mountain you got across, with that unbearable situation in front of you, with that darkness and foreboding spirit coming after you, you got to now develop a spirit of confidence, a spirit of trouble don't last always, of God's got this, shape yourself and say, God's going to make this happen. He said, because what we hope for, 
still giving the definition, an assurance about what we do not see. Um, this word, when we talk about faith, is not a feeling. You can feel bold once you act in faith, but if that feeling doesn't come, you still gotta act in faith. Are you with me? You gotta still act in faith. It's not what I think, it's about trusting God even when I can't see it. Now faith, just as our physical eyesight and sense gives us evidence, faith is always visible in an invisible world. Oh God, not my water now. I'm having a time with this water today. <laughs> this water, pray for me. But anyway, faith has its reason. This is, the Bible doesn't recommend a blind leap of faith. Now faith is our insurance, right? It's the evidence, it's our hope. So the physical eye can't produce uh, any faith in something until it sees it, right? For instance, if I tell you, go wait outside, um, your uncle's coming in a blue car to pick you up. You can wait outside, but until you see that blue car coming, you still believe he's coming, but until you see it, you won't act on what you believe. Faith is different. Faith, if I tell you, wait outside, your uncle is coming in a blue car, you really don't have to worry about when the car is coming, if the car is coming, looking around for the car. Faith says, a blue car is coming to get me. I don't have to worry about that. Um, it's the things hoped for. Your substance is that which we see, right? It's a substance. I can't see it. But I, I'm holding something in my hand. I'm, I'm holding my faith. What am I holding in my hand? I'm holding my faith. I'm holding my faith. I'm looking at my body. I'm looking around my surroundings. I'm going back in my mind and I'm holding. I'm, I'm holding that on um, in 1970 something when I had a terrible car accident. I'm holding in my hand the faith that it took for God to send the angels to get me out of the car. I'm holding in my hand a healing. I'm holding substance uh, a breakthrough. I'm holding the substance of how bad I was before I got saved and how God took things away from me. I'm holding how God has blessed my family, blessed my children, blessed my life. I'm, I'm holding the moments that God, that's the substance. I'm holding this, these things that I got by faith and they are my substance to know that I don't have to worry about what I see. I can't touch them. But these things have happened. Faith, I'm going to make a statement here. It's going to be tough for you to agree with, but I want you to hear me, and I'll make it work. Faith does not contradict reason. It goes beyond reason. When you go around and look at the reason I believe in something, the reason I believe I'm getting a check on Friday is because I worked all week. That's my reason. But what about if I had a need? I'm still working. I'm industrious. I'm not sitting around doing anything. But I was praying for God to meet my financial need. My reasoning is, it may not be I'm getting a check, but my reasoning is not contradictory because my reason is based on something stronger than anything man can provide. My reasoning is God, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, can meet my need. His word says he would meet my needs according to his riches and glory. His word says you have not because you ask not. His word says if I pray for it and trust him, it will come to pass. So I still can reason as to why I'm standing. I can give you a hundred reasons why I'm standing on something that you can't see and understand. And it's still reason, but it goes above worldly or earthly reasoning. Worldly and earthly reasoning is limited and can be upset or disturbed or disappointed. But if you have faith, God teaches us to wait on him, but the substance that I hold doesn't contradict and make sure that my reasoning is sound. How's your reasoning sound, Reverend? 
because I'm saved. You can't tell me God can't change a situation miraculously because he changed you and he changed me. Come on, somebody. And you can look back around your life and see that reason that faith is a stronger reason to believe than what the world has to believe. Right? So we believe that faith is stronger. Faith is a substance and evidence. We talked about that. It's not just this bare belief. It's a belief that it will happen. Write this down. Faith enables people in the past to overcome. Faith enabled people, i.e. the heroes in this text, to overcome by faith. And if faith is always now, and it worked then, it means that it can help us to believe in our now faith by seeing their then faith. Are you with me? I have now faith because I'm reading about their then faith. And if I have now faith and God doesn't change, my now faith can get me what their then faith got them. How do we know? The text says, for by it the elders had a good report. These are great examples, right, of a good report. Um, when we see how some of these patriarchs overcame stuff, what they had in common, they had different personalities, different consequences, different situations, but they all had faith. They all had the same faith. A faith that said God can do it. You got to believe God can do it. I want to take a pause right here and have you write in your chat. God can do it. Now, if you're like me, just put God will do it. First, you got to know he can before you know he will. So you got to settle that. You got you to settle your can. God can. Now you got to get over a hump when the enemy's in your ear of saying, and God will. And the last part of that faith, you got to say it. I will act on it, on what I believe. That's real faith. I'm acting on the fact that God can and God will. My part is to act on that because I believe it. God can, God will. So I got to act on what I believe. Um, then it says, obtain a good testimony, right? A good report. Good report is a good testimony. Um, a lot of these Jewish Christians were in tough situations. We go through these situations. You're going to see that a lot of these folk were going through some terrible times, but they still trusted God. Then it says, faith gives us understanding of the invisible. By faith, we understand that the worlds were made by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Understand. Wow, this is so good. Things that were seen, or let me say it this way. Faith is so strong that the unseen becomes the seen in my heart. Real faith, when I speak it, I speak things into existence through my words that would have never been out there if my word was not out there. But once I put my word out there, I created this thing that I'm looking for. I put my word out that God is getting ready to help me get a new car. Oh, I got a chance to explain. God uses natural means and supernatural means to bring things to pass. Sometimes God uses natural means but gives you supernatural favor for that natural means. I.e., when it's time for me to buy this car, God makes sure that the right car is on the lot, that it's the right amount of money that I, on my budget for my down payment, down payment and it's the right car that I need for the city. What I'm saying is, all of it, by faith, is given, God is given credit for all of it. And, and, and people who don't understand that will never live by faith. You can't think some things I did, some things just fell into place, some things just happened because the world did it. No, you got to know that every good and perfect gift, the book of James, that comes in my life, that happens, comes down from God in glory, comes down from the Father of lights. 
God is the one who makes good things happen, supernaturally, whatever. That's why it tells us that we understand the world were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made by things that are visible. Meaning that after a while, my faith gives me a belief to see what's going on. If we look at, uh, we understand the world were framed by the word of God, in Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light. Um, we understand that when God said that, he was making sure that we knew that he spoke something and something happened, and it happened by faith. And he left us the ability to follow, follow this pattern of faith in him. See, the difference is God did not have to have faith in anybody else or anything. He is God all by himself. But we utilize and release our power because we have faith in that God who is God all by himself and don't need nobody else. That's why my faith can work. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That's Psalms 33. Listen to those words again. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That's the God we serve. By faith we understand. Understanding just means it's an action. Even in times when it looks like uh, God can't bless a situation and the, the natural is so strong um, in, its, in our understanding that this is really like, how can this be? We'll find out with Abraham and Sarah. How could God make a promise to two old folk who are past childbearing age? You're going to have a child. Then wait 20 more years as they got older and told them it's going to come to pass. Faith might have seemed crazy, but if you held on to faith as your substance, you knew God could do it. Um, if God is the one who created, I tell people this when I'm praying for folks healing. If God is the one who created this body, God can make this body brand new. When you create something, you have the ability to make sure that it continues to run because you are intricate on every level of detail about this person. So let's look at, I think we're yeah, let's look at the first patriarch in this book. That's all we're going to have time for today. Hebrews 11. All right, so we started out, now faith is substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen, elders retain a good report. We understand, verse 3, through faith, the world's refrained by the word of God, right? And then we get to verse 4, which tells us, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speak. All right? We are going to pick up next week looking at Cain and Abel, our first witnesses, our first biblical testimonies of how the faith of God works when it's released out of our life. We're going to find out that Abraham got benefit because he released his faith by his actions and God was able to bless him. This Pastor Douglas again, don't forget, like, share, uh, send it out on your own social media. Let your friends and family know that we're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram every Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Our Bible study every Wednesday, 7 o'clock. You'll find one of those and always we'll have our social media. Join us. You will love what you see, the Shiloh experience. Amen. This is Pastor Duncan saying God bless you. See you next time.